Hello and welcome to worship here at Dun and Hillside Church on Sunday the 5th of September 2021. Friends, whether you have worshipped here with us many times before or whether this is the very first time, you are most welcome. There is a place here that is just for you. So please make yourself at home, make yourself comfortable, draw up a chair and be part of a congregation that is together, although apart. Friends, today's worship raises lots of different questions. This will be no surprise to you. It's my normal way. But today we consider the judgments that we make about other people based on their appearances. Who is part of the in crowd? Who do we want to associate ourselves with? And who do we want to stay away from? These are huge questions to consider. And I wonder, as we think about the appearances of other people, whether we might also be able to question the masks that we put on ourselves. The times when we pretend that actually we're very confident when we're not. The times when we paint on a happy face even though we're going through some incredibly challenging times. The times when we feel as though amongst other Christians, we have to pretend like we know the Bible inside out. We don't have any questions about how to pray and we certainly don't have any doubts. But it's not really true underneath it all. I wonder what kind of mask you put on whether it's for work, whether it's in personal situations, whether it's just every day. And I wonder too, which people you would choose not to associate with. I wonder today if our story about Jesus might change our minds about it. Well, we learn something new in James chapter 2, building on last week's reading from James chapter 1. I hope that as we worship together, we will all keep relatively open minds and be ready for the Spirit to teach us even as we worship. Our call to worship. We long for living faith and so we come to worship hoping that our time together, our time with God, will help to unclench our fists, will slowly soften our hearts, will quiet our voices and open our ears. Revive our faith, O oh God, that we might serve you with glad and joyful hearts. And so, let's worship God.
let us come before God in prayer. Let us pray. Mighty God, King of kings, Lord of hosts, how hard it is, indefinable and unnameable one, for us to know what to call you. We want a title that will show our respect without taking us out of the upside down world of the kingdom that Jesus came to establish and back into the oppressive hierarchies of this world to which he was so utterly opposed. Our brother, our companion, the servant king. No names or titles can capture it all. Not for nothing did you tell Moses, don't worry about my name, I just am. So perhaps we should simply be quiet for a moment or two and let the crazy, wonderful mystery of your being fill and surround us. Lord, you value people for who they are, not how much they possess. You notice the invisible ones. You hear the silent ones. You see the potential in those who have long since written themselves off as worthless. You shower compassion on those who have been most harshly judged. And you judge the powerful and the privileged by how much compassion they show. Forgive us, gracious God, for our every failure to see, or to listen, or to care. Flood us with your mercy and your grace, and perhaps then we can start becoming what you have called us to be. Your eyes, your ears, your hands, your feet, and your heart in this world that you made, and have never stopped loving. And so may we join our voices together along with the prayers of our hearts as we say the prayer that Jesus taught us, the Lord's Prayer. Please use whichever version is most familiar to you or if you are watching, you can use the words on the screen. We pray together saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory for ever. Amen. Our readings today are both taken from the New Testament of the Bible. Our first reading is from the Gospel according to St Mark, reading chapter 7, verses 24 to 37. Listen now for the word of God. Jesus left that place and went to the vicinity of Tyre. He entered a house and did not want anyone to know it yet he could not keep his presence secret. In fact, as soon as she heard about him, a woman whose little daughter was possessed by an impure spirit came and fell at his feet. The woman was a Greek, born in Syrian Phoenicia. She begged Jesus to drive the demon out of her daughter. First, let the children eat all they want, he told her for it is not right to take the children's bread and toss it to the dogs. Lord, she replied, even the dogs under the table eat the children's crumbs. Then he told her, for such a reply you may go, the demon has left your daughter. She went home and found her child lying on the bed and the demon gone. Then Jesus left the vicinity of Tyre and went through Sidon, down to the Sea of Galilee and into the region of the Decapolis. There some people brought to him a man who was deaf and could hardly talk. 
and they begged Jesus to place his hand on him. After he took him aside, away from the crowd, Jesus put his fingers into the man's ears. Then he spat and touched the man's tongue. He looked up to heaven and with a deep sigh said to him, Ephatha, which means be opened. At this the man's ears were opened, his tongue was loosed and he began to speak plainly. Jesus commanded them not to tell anyone, but the more he did so, the more they kept talking about it. People were overwhelmed with amazement. He has done everything well, they said. He even makes the deaf hear and the mute speak. Amen. Our second reading is taken from the book of James and we read together chapter 2, verses 1 to 17. My brothers and sisters, Believers in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ must not show favouritism. Suppose a man comes into your meeting wearing a gold ring and fine clothes and a poor man in filthy old clothes also comes in. If you show special attention to the man wearing fine clothes and say, here's a good seat for you, but say to the poor man, you stand there or sit on the floor by my feet. Have you not discriminated among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Listen, my dear brothers and sisters, has not God chosen those who are poor in the eyes of the world to be rich in faith and to inherit the kingdom he promised those who love him? But you have dishonoured the poor. Is it not the rich who are exploiting you? Are they not the ones who are dragging you into court? Are they not the ones who are blaspheming the noble name of him to whom you belong? If you really keep the royal law found in scripture, love your neighbour as yourself. You are doing right. But if you show favouritism, you sin and are convicted by the law as lawbreakers. For whoever keeps the whole law and yet stumbles at just one point is guilty of breaking all of it. For he who said you shall not commit adultery also said you shall not murder. If you do not commit adultery but do commit murder, you have become a law breaker. Speak and act as those who are going to be judged by the law that gives freedom, because judgment without mercy will be shown to anyone who has not been merciful. Mercy triumphs over judgment. What good is it, my brothers and sisters, if someone claims to have faith but has no deeds? Can such faith save them? Suppose a brother or a sister is without clothes and daily food. If one of you says to them, go in peace, keep warm and well fed, but does nothing about their physical needs, what good is it? In the same way, faith by itself, if it is not accompanied by action, is dead. Amen. Friends, I find that we are in a particularly challenging season of readings just now. We are making our way through Mark's Gospel and these are accompanied by readings from the book of James, which is also in the New Testament. The combination of these readings lays down a massive challenge for each one of us individually and also corporately as churches and congregations. We are being asked to consider how we ensure that we put our faith into action, how we should be aware of the prejudices we have and that we should take action so that we do not discriminate against different folks. We are being asked to consider how we listen to the gospel, how we hear the words 
the word of God contained in scripture and what we do with that. We are being challenged to ensure that we have a living faith, a relationship with God that is flourishing even in the midst of our personal struggles, even in the midst of our doubts and our moments when we just want to be angry at God. It's really important to have all of these things together, but boy, it's not easy. It's really not easy. And so last week, we were looking at the beginning of Mark's Gospel, uh, sorry, the beginning of chapter 7 of Mark's Gospel, which says that it's not what we put into our bodies that would make us unclean or sinful, but what comes out of our bodies, our words, our actions, the way that we treat other people. In James last week, in chapter one, it was all about listening, listening to the word of God, understanding the word of God in scripture, but not just listening, taking it on board, learning as we do and taking that message out in our words, in our actions to others as we care for others. It's that gospel imperative. We need to go out and share the good news, but we do so by caring for others. This week, we are further challenged. The continuation of Mark chapter 7 looks at Jesus interacting with a Syrophoenician woman. She was considered to be one of the lowest of the low and she was trying to ensure that her children could be looked after. There's actually an insult included in this reading at the mention of dogs. This was a derogatory term that was used uh, against particular uh, religious people and, and folks who were different. And yet, and yet Jesus healed her daughter. He also went on then in this reading to heal a deaf and mute man. Both folks were told not to tell anyone about the experience, which is exactly the opposite of what they then would have done. But when we turn to James chapter 2, I think this is where it is brought into sharper focus. The teaching for this week is brought into sharper focus. It is not what is on the outside that counts, but what is on the inside. It's not just what's on the inside, but it's what we do with that. How do we reach out to other people? And if we are concerned with what is on the outside of other people, then how can we truly view every person we meet as a child of God? And how can we treat them lovingly? If we can't see past what is on the outside, we are going to struggle as Christians living out the gospel, learning and living out our learning about how to love one another. It's really challenging material. It really, really is. But it's so important. It's very, very easy for us to fall into the trap of judging someone on the basis of how they look. Is it the way that they're dressed? Is it how they style their hair? Is it their makeup, their jewellery, whatever shoes they wear? Very easy to, to try and turn around and say, oh no, no, we never do that. But I wonder what would happen if one Sunday in church, or in your home or to your home, a person turned up who had been living on the streets for quite some time. They perhaps haven't had access to a shower or bath, bathing facilities for some time. They have been living moment to moment. Let's assume that there may be a bit of a smell accompanying them and not a pleasant one. They perhaps look 
quite grubby. Their clothes are worn and torn from living on the streets. They're maybe cold, desperate for a hot drink, something just to put a bit of warmth into them, even though everybody else knows that hot drinks aren't served until after the service. Or it's not quite the right time for you to put the kettle on at home. Would you welcome them in? Honestly. Would you choose to welcome them into your pew? Would you sit alongside them? Would you take the time to find out their name? Perhaps you would. And that's a wonderful quality to have. But I suspect that many of us, if we are being entirely honest, would have some doubts. If you are watching the service, you will have seen throughout the service the image of a statue created by Timothy Schmaltz, which is called Homeless Jesus. It depicts Jesus as a homeless man sleeping on a bench. And the only reason that we can tell that it is Jesus is that he has a hole in his foot from where he was fixed to the cross. He could be any other homeless man on this planet, except for that detail. And it is that detail that is an absolute jolt to the heart. Because if Jesus were to come again tomorrow, what would he look like? Would we recognise him? What would we be looking for? And if he were to come into the church building and he wasn't wearing something smart or clean, if he hadn't cut his hair for a while, if he hasn't, hadn't shaved for a while, <laughs> what would we think of him? Would we be ready to accept him as he is? I wonder if you could take a moment to be completely honest with yourself and think about some of the names or words that have been used to describe people who have been encountered along the way and who folks, let's face it, were discriminating against. Perhaps they're words that you have used. Perhaps they are words that other people have used. But let's take a few moments just to think of some of those descriptions that we have heard. How would you feel? If Jesus walked in and we didn't accept him because of the way that he looked or simply because he didn't seem like us. How would you feel if you heard someone describing Jesus as a bum or a waif or stray? I... In, in our family setup, I have gone from raising teenagers first to now raising a child, right, from, from a baby. And it's been quite strange to do it in that order. Uh, Callum's teenage years don't fill, fill me with as much fear because we've already been through a lot of the things with Scott and Sam. But one of the things that surprised me as we were looking after them, raising them through their teenage years, was just how powerful peer pressure was. There were certain brands of clothing and shoes that the young people would insist on wearing, and if they didn't wear them, they were not accepted. I was always very honest with them, 
and was able to say that I would do my best to get them the brand names, but I could never guarantee that it would be this season's fashion. I'm sure that there were times when that made them feel left out or different. And it seems ridiculous to us, those of us who were brought up without having all the named brands, as long as we had clothes on our back and shoes on our feet, at the end of the day, it truly didn't matter. And yes, I'm sure there were times when when I wanted brands, although I wasn't so concerned about that. But really, it's become a huge, huge deal for teenagers nowadays. And you can see it even creeping into the, the lower ages than that. It does seem ridiculous because at the end of the day, as long as you're wearing clothes, what does it really matter? But I wonder as adults, do we do the same? Are we expecting other people that we're associating with to be similarly presented to us? Now that could be in clothing. It could be in the way we speak or the holidays that we go on, or the properties that we live in. I wonder if we actually still judge one another if we happen to be different. Or are we able to keep an open mind and get to know the person inside regardless of how they look? I hope it's the latter, but I suspect to an extent it is always the former. These readings are challenging, not only because it challenges us to act upon our faith, but it also holds up a mirror to each and every one of us to challenge where our prejudices lie. Now, as a student of peace and reconciliation studies, let me tell you this. There is no one I have met in my entire existence who has not had some form of prejudice. It's lovely to think that we can just wipe that clean. But honestly, we will all have some level of prejudice, perhaps from people that we have met and we take, take those traits and think, mm, don't like that, and then apply it whenever we see that again. Or it might be because of some particular factor. The important thing is that we are able to be honest with ourselves and recognise when our prejudices come into play. Because one thing is absolutely true. Simply having prejudices does not necessarily lead to an act of discrimination. Because we have the opportunity to be aware of our prejudices and stop it before it affects how we treat other people. I wonder if this is what James wants us to do. He says, it's not what's on the outside that counts, it's what's on the inside. And that's a great message for each and every one of us. As Christians, that's not enough to just do that for ourselves, to be thinking not just about how we present ourselves, but how we are living out our faith. But living out that faith takes us or should take us to people amongst whom we are a bit uncomfortable. It should probably lead us to places where we feel uncomfortable. In our reading from Mark's Gospel today, we read of two situations where I suspect Jesus was actually pretty uncomfortable. And yet, and yet, you can see through his actions that he accepted and loved the people he came across, even whilst he was a little bit put out. I wonder if we might need to look to ourselves and challenge our behaviour. I think we've got some hard work ahead of us, folks. If you're anything like me, that is. <laughs> Amen.
Friends, let us pray. Our world overflows with stories, Jesus. So many lives, so many ways of being human. So why are we satisfied with so few? Why do we keep telling the same stories over and over of the wealthy and powerful and beautiful? Why do we so carelessly pass by the rich and unpredictable stories of the unseen, who in a million magical ways make a life out of nothing? God, forgive our narrow interests and our lazy entertainments. Make us biographers of the least, who listen to the untold stories of the shadow people and bring them into the light. Give us the curiosity and the restlessness to search out the forgotten, the neglected, the unwanted, the discarded and the worn out, to learn their legends and to acknowledge their place in the epic story of humanity. So we dare to pray that you will help us to be more Christ-like, fraternising with those on the edges or tucked away in the corners. Lead us into the uncomfortable spaces where you wish us to be your presence. Open our eyes to see your reflection in the faces of everyone we meet. May our giving be sacrificial in all we do and may we be open about the faith that inspires us to do it. Help us as a community to be loving, accepting, affirming and kind. For we dedicate our lives to Jesus, our Saviour and Lord, in whose name we pray. Amen.
Friends, I don't know about you, but as we walk through this year B, the second year of the Revised Common Lectionary, that's the arrangement of readings throughout the year, I have been finding this season quite challenging. We're being asked lots of questions about our faith and our actions, about how we treat other people and about how we view ourselves There's lots in there to think about and so I don't doubt that even as we bring our worship to a close today that we will go ahead into our weeks carrying some of these thoughts, some of these conversations with us. I do hope that you will. I think that it's it's wrong that we think about doing church and doing worship and doing any sort of thinking around faith solely on a Sunday. It's simply that point in the week where we have chosen to gather together. And through this medium, you might find that you're doing this at a different point in the week yourselves. But as we leave this time and this sacred space that we've carved out together, may I leave you with a blessing. Let us go out from this sacred time and space, knowing that we are loved by God, the one who opens our eyes, the one who opens our hearts, the one who heals, and the one who will never let us go. And now may the blessing of Almighty God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit, be with us all, those we love and those whom we struggle to love, both now and and evermore. Amen. Friends, I hope to see you again soon. Until I do, please do stay safe and God bless.